going. So welcome everybody. This is, uh, as you know well, this is um, the first speaker of the IEDP uh, yearly speaker series. Um, managing it now fully on Zoom. Delighted to have you with us. Um, we are especially pleased that our first speaker today is Sarah Dryden Peterson from the Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, on a topic that is uh, so pertinent in the in the the days we're in today. Uh, the title of her talk is "Refugee Education: Dilemmas of Collective Responsibility." And um, one only has to look at the word collective responsibility and note that yesterday was the opening of the UN General Assembly, where if you read today's New York Times, collective responsibility is not something that was uh, at least in the forefront of the news if you opened up today's newspaper. Um, and, but it is something that many of us in this room, Zoom room, um, strive for. Um, I. Uh, I mentioned to Professor Peterson that I would have to be brief because our time this morning is brief. We will have a stop at nine o'clock. Uh, she will take about half the time approximately, and then we will have Q&A questions and answers for about half the time. Um, on that matter, just to say that our uh, trustee grad student assistant for this, uh, Anaita Kumar, will be monitoring the chat room and keeping track of questions and comments along the way as best you can. But we will open it up to waving hands in the traditional manner uh, when uh, Professor Peterson is done with her presentation and get the questions while they're hot that way. But we'll then, uh, but don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat room because she will be monitoring it and flag them toward the end as well. But now it's my pleasure to at least give a short introduction. I promise to be much too brief, uh, but I, I will have to do that because she has such an interesting background. She's associate professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, I was looking up her areas of expertise and they cover so many areas that we at the University of Pennsylvania and in the broader community care about. Just list a few of them, civic education, diversity, family issues, immigrant issues, uh, broadly speaking, uh, research methods in international education. Um, I was looking at the projects she's been involved in. They're, they're multiple pages long, but several that caught my attention. Um, <clears throat> exclusion and conflict and education in Botswana. Uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon. Um, Peru, Colombia, Botswana, Brazil, a global sense of um, improving meaningful education. This is a good question to ask her what she means by meaningful and, and, <clears throat> and so on. I mean, a very active member in CIES, an organization that many of you in this uh, Zoom call are familiar with and uh, plan on being involved with uh, moving forward. Um, Sarah Dryden Peterson, just to sum up, is really one of the shining stars in the field of international comparative education. She's working on the kinds of issues and, and policy practice and research that we think, and at least in IEDP, are really key for our future. And I will stop there um, and uh, welcome Sarah Dryden Peterson again. Floor is yours. Thank, thanks so much, Dan and Anita. It's just great to have you welcome me to this group and I'm delighted to be here today. I know we're in so many different places in the world and um, I find that really exciting. Um, I'm gonna share my screen um, here and can you just give me a thumbs up about whether it's the correct display once I go to presenter view here? Do you see just my slides or notes also now? We also see your notes. Okay, perfect. So then I will do it this way. Great. Um, thanks so much. Um, and um, I'm just really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have today as well. As Dan said, the title of my talk is Refugee Education, Dilemmas of Collective Responsibility. And I'd like to draw out some of what I see as critical questions about refugee education such as where power lies within 
refugee education planning and practice, um, and the forms of belonging that education might cultivate as we think through the shape of our collective future. So I want to start actually with a metaphor that comes from a picture book. So you'll see on the screen here a very cute little rabbit um, who is in this book that I love called Not a Box by Antoinette Porti. And this rabbit character starts out, like you see, sitting in this cardboard box. Like you, I'm sure, have seen many children all over the world do this. Any unclaimed cardboard box becomes one of the best playthings ever. But as this rabbit in the book, and as all children know, it's not actually a box. It's a race car. It's anything that you might want it to be. Until, of course, the grown-up comes along and tells you what it is, what the right answer is. It's a box. And since the grown-up is bigger and more powerful, often that idea sticks. We find in our research that refugee children's and families' experiences and the futures that they imagine for themselves often don't neatly fit inside the boxes of nation state borders, into the boxes of belonging, and into the boxes of schooling that are shaped within nation states. They are learning about a world in which they don't fit. I wanted to share this metaphor to keep these boxes in mind as I share a little bit more about our research on refugee education and some of these dilemmas of collective responsibility. So let's zoom for a second out to some bigger context. Questions about responsibility for refugee education are set in the context of widespread conflict and conflict-induced displacement and migration. I show this map here just to emphasize how widespread experiences of conflict and conflict-induced displacement are. In every year between 1990, between 40 and 68 countries were involved in armed conflict, which encompasses between 46 to 79 percent of the world's population. Of course, countries are large. Not all regions of countries are involved in the same way. But the sense of living within a nation state in which conflict is a lived reality is a widespread human experience today. Conflict and conflict-induced displacement largely affect civilians and children and impact on education. You'll notice that this map of out-of-school children um, is from before the, the, the um, school closures that have been um, widespread since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic last December. Um, so before the pandemic and before the kind of pandemic-induced displacement of young people from school, there were about 62 million children out of school of course, many more now, but 50% of them live in conflict settings. So this idea that conflict and um, lack of access to school go hand in hand is very clear globally. These challenges for education are largely centered geographically close to conflict settings. So 85% of refugees live in a country that neighbors their country of origin. In fact, conflict-induced displacement usually involves a fairly short migration. Um, this means that the magnitude of effects of conflict and conflict-induced displacement are very unevenly experienced globally. In Lebanon, for example, one quarter of the population are Syrian refugees. This compares to the United States where one-tenth of one percent of the population are refugees. So as we think about comparing across context, these differences in not just numbers of refugees, but how widespread and what percentage of a population refugees make up is critical. As we think about this, education of refugees really raises different sets of questions, normative, political, and empirical. So we have normative questions about who is responsible for provision of services to refugees, embedded in political realities of increasingly closed borders, and empirical realities of who is actually taking responsibility for the education of refugees on a daily basis. And when I talk about taking responsibility, I want us to be thinking really expansively. Young people take responsibility for their education. Families take responsibility. States take responsibility. And we're going to look across these different sets of actors in terms of this question of responsibility. 
questions about the responsibility for refugee education are embedded in questions about the purposes of education, learning of what and belonging to what. In our historical analysis, we see the responsibility for refugee education really shift over time. So post-World War II is what I call the liberation phase of refugee education, really connected to Cold War and independence struggles across Africa and Asia. Refugee education was really a community endeavor. So Zimbabwean refugees in Botswana, for example, self-organizing schools with the very explicit purpose of preparing leaders for a future Zimbabwe. From about 1985, we have what I call the standardization phase of refugee education, where global actors took on responsibility for the content and the funding of refugee education. Scholars writing about this era talk about UNHCR, the UN Agency for Refugees, as a kind of pseudo state in the provision of services, including education. Um, so this is the era also of large refugee camps, which makes the global responsibility possible. Afghans in Pakistan, Somalis in Kenra, Kenya, Rwandis in Democratic Republic of Congo, living very separately, purposefully very separately from nation state populations. We're now in what I call the nationalization phase, where policy and global commitments, at least in rhetoric, to responsibility sharing, such as the Global Compact on Refugees, advocate for inclusion of refugees in national schools. And depending on what your context of schooling is, this may not seem like such a radical idea. In the United States, for example, refugees are, we would think, of course, included in national schools. There's no question um, that young people would be part of national schools and not have separate schools. But this has not been the norm um, across, hi across history and these other phases um, of refugee education. So this inclusion approach where refugee young people have access to national schools is now used in most but not all refugee hosting contexts. So in some countries like Malaysia, for example, let me just go back for a sec, um, uh, school ref national schools are not open um, to uh, refugees. Um, and in other countries, especially especially where refugees live in camp settings, such as Kenya, we see an inclusion involving curriculum and language. So for example, in Kenya, the Kenyan curriculum and English and Kiswahili as languages of instruction, even though refugee and national children are separate because they live geographically separate in camps um, in, in the example of Kenya. So this is a kind of inclusion, but a geographic separation. Yet another model of inclusion is the one that we see in Lebanon. And I'm gonna focus on some specific examples from Lebanon um, today. In Lebanon, inclusion of refugee young people means attending the same school, the same physical school building, but at different times of the day. So Syrian refugees use Lebanese curriculum, learn from Lebanese teachers, have access to the Lebanese examination system, but they attend school in the afternoon compared to Lebanese nationals who attend school in the morning. Important to note about all these different ways in which inclusion has been adapted for different national contexts is that in all cases, refugee young people are attending schools in contexts of national marginalization. So when we think about um, the availability of poor schools for poor people, generally, as Tim Williams describes it, we see this magnified in, in settings of refugee education. So as refugees are being integrated, included in schools in Lebanon, the public schools in Lebanon to which they have access are only chosen by 30% of the Lebanese national population, those with the means opt for private schooling um, opportunities. So I'd like to talk now about two frameworks that I find helpful in considering how education might create opportunities in the present and in the future for refugee young people. The first connects to the kinds of inequalities that refugees experience in schools, and the second connects to divergent views of refugees' futures. So this first framework is really about st standardization and autonomy in education. Within formal national education systems, a hallmark of recent education history globally is a kind of vacillation between standardization and autonomy across regions and schools, and then autonomy at very local levels within cities and districts. 
We find that in places where unity is tenuous, where there is a history of conflict and intense current divisions, the pendulum often swings towards standardization aimed at conflict avoidance or conflict containment. Um, Galtung describes the differences between what he calls negative peace, the absence of direct or personal violence, and positive peace, which is the absence of structural violence, the kind of unequal life chances and power um, that adhere to opportunities for individuals. So if we think about positive peace, positive peace is really not only the absence of direct violence, but also the presence of conditions that allow individuals to access equal opportunities. And I'd like us to keep in mind this distinction between negative peace and positive peace, because we see this playing out in the kinds of planning and outcomes in refugee education. So often assumed is that refugees find negative peace or the absence of direct violence when they arrive in a host country, having fled a conflict context. Yet the kind of sanctuary that would provide freedom from direct violence is often quite absent or incomplete, even in context of exiles. So in refugee education settings, so acute is often the need to focus on violence prevention and the means of daily sustenance that dimensions of positive peace and the connections between present experiences and future opportunities can often be ignored, particularly in educational content and pedagogy. So access to these equal opportunities requires redistribution to counter resource-based inequalities, but also recognition to counter identity-based inequalities that refugee young people are experiencing. In education, we often see that redistribution to address resource-based inequalities can happen through standardization distribution of resources in equal manners to all schools. Of course, this doesn't correct for already existing inequities in access to resources. But recognition to address identity-based inequalities really cuts to the core between these tensions of standardization and autonomy. So what are the trade-offs between the autonomy needed for recognition and education that could enable participation um, for all and the standardization that might attempt to address some of the resource-based inequalities that are often easier to accomplish. What are also the potential costs of autonomy, particularly in these settings of division and conflict that might serve to weaken ability to communicate, to trust each other and feel solidarity across group differences? These are some of the dilemmas often raised in terms of autonomy in education. This tension, of course, doesn't just occur in refugee education. It's really challenging to resolve within national education systems, but is heightened for refugees. So modern nation states are really premised on assumptions that provisions of services to citizens, including education, is the responsibility of that nation state. But for non-citizens and likely never citizens, such as refugees, who is responsible for their education? In a situation of standardization, we might think about questions like what entity is the standardizing power? Is it the country of origin? Is it the host country? Is it a global actor of some sort? In a situation of autonomy, how might we think about autonomy from what? Autonomy toward what end? And what are the consequences of standardization or autonomy for recognition of refugees as connected to combating identity-based inequalities in their context of exile and for their futures. For refugees, as we think about disrupting identity-based inequalities, this current phase of nationalization where refugees are included in national systems, it's important to think about how refugees are often perceived to be outside any kind of national imaginary as constructed in school content. So that efforts towards recognition, even if present, within national education systems often exclude refugee young people. I find that perceptions of refugees' futures are really connected to possibilities for disrupting these kind of identity-based inequalities. So I just want to talk about some of what we see in our work as connected to possible futures for refugees as the second kind of framework. Responsibility for education taken by any entity, by students, by families, by a community, by a nation state, 
usually happens with some vision of the future benefits and benefits construed widely, be they economic, civil, social development. So what are the possible futures for refugees? UNHCR has long established three, what they see as possible policy pathways forward for refugees to the future, a future of resettlement, yet this option is only active by 1% of refugees globally. This is resettlement from a country of first asylum, so say Lebanon for a Syrian refugee, to a third country like the United States, like Canada, like Norway. A future of return, which we see is likely untenable given the long-standing natures of conflict, which now last between 10 and 25 years, even though return is often the very desired future for refugees, still long despite these long displacements. Um, a future of transnationalism we find is often what young people plan for, even though they may clearly perceive limited opportunities in all of the national spaces in which they're imagining that transnational future. And a future in the hosting nation state, this integration, which is probable, um, but discussion of integration and policies and practices designed toward that future are often politically untenable. Um, in fact, if we just think about the rhetoric of this, initially in 2012, when policies began to change to include refugees in national education systems, the word used was integration in all the policy documents. A few years later, that word has been changed to inclusion because it is less politically charged with this idea that integration includes identity chains and shifts and cultural and political dimensions that many hosting nation states quite understandably, also including tensions and histories of conflict, um, can't make politically tenable in that kind of context. So while inclusion was derived as a way to think about education, preparing young people for the future given extended periods of exile, even this future of integration or inclusion seems volatile um, for most refugee young people. So we see in this case of refugee education a kind of misalignment with where responsibility for education is resting and the future benefits as we think about refugees being included in national education systems. Within the nation state of exile, the host nation state, not being able to foresee economic contributions given the lack of right to work, the lack of right to own property, and also limited in terms of the civil and social participation given fear, xenophobia, rejection, and limited, if any, political rights. So how is this misalignment um, experienced by teachers? I'm just gonna um, come back to this slide for a moment as we think about these four different possible futures. I wanna look at the misalignment of education by the state, but not for the state through three different lenses, as experienced by teachers, as experienced by students, and as experienced by the state using some examples from Lebanon as a case. So here I'm gonna read this quote and have us think about how the misalignment is experienced by teachers. This is a grade nine civics class in Beirut. A Lebanese teacher explained to a class of all Syrian students, the process of filing an administrative complaint. This is an examinable topic for their high stakes brevet exam, which allows entry to high school. So for example, the teacher posed, what should a student who has a typo in her name on the certificate to take the grade nine exams do? She won't be allowed to take the exam if there's a typo. Then the teacher paused and rephrased, mm, let's say she's Lebanese, what should she do? What would she do? So I'd like us just to take a moment and you can make some notes for yourselves. What, what is the dilemma? that this Lebanese teacher is experiencing here with her class of all Syrian students. Would anyone like to share some of how they're thinking about this teacher dilemma? Like Dan said, we can wave our hands if that feels comfortable. Or you can just unmute yourself also. <laughs> 
I have a quick comment. Great, wonderful, go ahead. Um, I think uh, with the teacher saying, let's say she is Lebanese, what would she do? Um, sometimes it's not good to generalize. And I think grouping people in just their identity of what that person would do, it causes some problematic issues. I think that's something um, to take note of. Great. Th thanks for that. And I think this idea of really clearly separating there's a group of Lebanese students and there's a group of Syrian students um, really impacted on how students experienced um, this lesson. One of the things in talking with the teacher about this scenario afterwards that we heard is this kind of thinking process that this teacher was teaching the curriculum that she's always taught. That's the national curriculum for, for the Lebanese education system. She knows the students will be examined on this. And she's always thought about trying to create examples that students would resonate with. So instead of an administrative complaint about some bylaw in building a structure or um, that adults might be more concerned about, she has this example of a student, a student in the same grade as her students who might actually take action on an administrative complaint. But as she's teaching, she realizes that her students have no right to file an administrative complaint. That in fact, this idea of a, a civic action that is, is brought about and talked about in class actually has no relevance or no possibility for the students in front of her was this kind of aha moment where she realized she needed to say something different and the lesson kind of fell flat as a lesson not so much about taking civic action, but about in fact what walls were in place to prevent young Syrians from taking action. Let's look now at an experience of um, students in thinking about this um, misalignment of the context as they negotiate mixed messages of belonging. So this is also a grade nine class and a Syrian student, Munir, arrived to his Lebanese public school to find a periodic table that his friends had carefully made was ripped and thrown on the floor. The teacher said that the students in the morning shift did this because they felt like Munir and his friends were, quote, intruders on the school. The principal told the class that maybe the Lebanese students did this to the periodic table because after all it was, quote, their school first. The teachers asked their Syrian students not to leave any trace of themselves in the classrooms that were occupied by Lebanese students each morning. As we talked about this example, this experience with Munir, he said, it's like they're giving the school to us so we can learn, but not to be established. As you think about this example, let's think about this question of what Munir, as a Syrian student in grade nine, understands about his relationship to the state and the implications of that for his education. This idea that here's this opportunity to learn, but I know that that does not come with the opportunity to be established. So what does that mean for my future? We also see this real tension of states trying to negotiate the misalignment. It's easy to kind of sympathize with students and demonize teachers and think that the state is making all these rules that make it hard. And yet I think critical to understanding some of these dilemmas of collective responsibility is that states are also in these real dilemmas about who to serve and how to do it given limited resources. So let's again look at this example of Lebanon. This is an example looking at 2014 and then at last school year. So in 2014, a Ministry of Education and Higher Education official who we interviewed said, we're concerned about the stability of our education system and how to keep the level as it was before the crisis. The refugee crisis has already had a big negative impact on the education level in public schools by stretching the system to the maximum. So five years later, as the, at the start of last school year, 2019-2020, the Ministry of Education and Higher Education reported, reported a funding gap of more than 30 million US dollars in serving refugee students within the national education system. At that point, the minister circulated a memo to all schools 
noting a freeze on enrollment of non-Lebanese students unless funding was made available to meet the global responsibility sharing commitments, which had been agreed to at the London conference in 2016, the Brussels, the first Brussels conference in 2017, and the second Brussels conference in 2018. So we he see here one way of seeing a state abdicating its responsibility to educate children who are within the national borders. And on the other hand, a state saying, wait a minute, who is responsible? And how do we um, navigate this sense of working with a limited set of resources and also having a responsibility to the citizens, um, knowing that global actors um, have made these commitments to help shoulder the financial responsibility for the education um, of refugees. So in some ways we see the Lebanese state here calling out this misalignment of refugee education by the state, but not for the state um, and saying, we are not going to take on this responsibility unless it is a collective responsibility and also acted on by global actors. So here's our rabbit sitting in the box again. Um, at school in Beirut, Munir, the Syrian student we met earlier, learned many things. He learned how to factor numbers. We watched him learn how to form co covalent bonds by watching teachers and students grasp hands with each other. Um, but he also learned that teachers he thought cared about, he and his friends, would not stand up for them when Lebanese young people treated them unfairly. He learned that he didn't have the same rights as his Lebanese peers, but he didn't learn in school also how to thread the strands of his past with his present and his aspired future to be established somewhere. We see this rhetoric on refugee education continue to focus on avoiding what Gordon Brown has long called a lost generation of Syrians in particular. This, the focus of these campaigns is really on ensuring that no refugee child be denied their right to education while in exile. A kind of focus, I argue, on the negative piece dimensions of refugee education. But when we talk with students like Munir, a lost generation really has a different meaning. He thinks about it as a generation that misses out on access to the education that provides resources and recognition and the skills and knowledge that he might use to build the kinds of opportunities that would work more toward positive peace. So on the last page of this not a box book, Anton Antoinette Porti portrays the rabbit coming up with a new idea that instead of this being a box, it could be a race car, it could be a, a fire engine, but the adult keeps telling you, no, that's not the right answer. The rabbit says, well, then maybe it's my not, 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 not a box. And I wonder if we can take this kind of metaphor and the experiences of teachers and students and states in trying to imagine what 